Great. Good volume. Awesome. How you guys doing? Woo! Yes. How was work tonight? Today. Good. School work. Awesome. So welcome. This is a privilege to be able to have you and host you guys here uh, tonight. And we're going to be starting off uh, this executive panel, this uh, executive speaker series tonight. So, um, so good evening. My name is Rafael Lavallade. I'm currently the vice president and uh, director of technology for YCP Phoenix Young Faculty Professionals here in Phoenix. Um, so, which is the nation's largest, fastest growing organization of Catholic young professionals in this broad national network with to you have uh, family and peers, all striving, all for the same thing, working in witness for Christ, and growing in confidence to, to live our faith openly in this world, especially with these struggles that we're living nowadays, as you guys know, right? Uh, YCP's mission is to provide you and all young adults in their 20s and 30s with the belonging, support, and encouragement you need to live your faith in joy and confidence through your everyday work. If you know someone who will benefit from this community, please invite them to all our next event, which we have uh, events throughout. Basically, most of our events are Thursday nights, uh, as you guys can tell. And it kind of come uh, are part of like happy hours, executive uh, speaker series like tonight and executive panels uh, discussions like next month is coming up. So just kind of put it up in your calendar and you'll be getting more information about it. It's Thursday nights and once a month. In just a few minutes, our speaker will be share, uh, sharing us their real life example of being a witness for Christ through everyday work. I would like to remind you that this event, the executive speaker series, is just of the programs YCP has to offer, like I was explaining earlier. There's many more, and you'll hear more about them in a little bit, okay? So tonight, I would like to welcome Mar Bonilla, which she will lead us in uh, our prayer tonight. She's the Director of Evangelization, so welcome. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here today. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, to help us focus. We ask that you, your Holy Spirit, especially fills up Patrick, our speaker, so that, so that he can share you with us. We pray for all the people that are here, that he help us put our worries aside so we can learn and grow this community together. We ask that you take care of all the people that wanted to come, but were not able to, especially those recovering or in need of your help. We ask that you also protect and heal our families, especially those suffering from mental health problems. All of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mama. So, as you guys can tell, I'm not usually the person that's up front, and uh, we are missing our beloved uh, president, Sally Lopez, which is not able to join us tonight. Uh, she actually had surgery today, so just pray for her, the great recovery. We'll keep you, and she's actually watching tonight right there live. So, hi, Sally. We miss you. We really miss you. So, um, thank you, Matt. So, um, now... I'm pleased to introduce you to Father Alex, who guides us deeper in our faith as our chaplain. He couldn't be with us today, but he sends us a special message from Poland, where he's actually currently in a pilgrimage right now. So if you guys can tell, I don't know if it's up in the screen. And your intentions with me. God bless. I was just going to do a There it goes. Here I am, my friends, on my first day in Poland. And I'm standing outside the museum of St. John Paul II, as you can see right behind me. I'm in a square. It's beautiful here in Poland. We just arrived. We're on the outskirts of Krakow. And I look forward to continuing 
our pilgrimage here with the wonderful people here in Poland, praying for all of you and keeping you all and your intentions with me. God bless. As well, he wanted to send us a message specifically for YCP uh, regarding uh, your here right now. It's a special message for us. He's praying for us. Hello, my friends. Here I am in Poland at the Shrine of Divine Mercy, and just behind me there I celebrated Mass at the Convent of St. Faustina, and it's where Jesus gave her the message of Divine Mercy, the message to trust in Him. Jesus, I trust in you. Today in our world, I know there's many things that we can be worried about. The pandemic, our health, work, family, relationships. But Jesus tells us to immerse ourselves in his mercy and in his love. And I think this is a message for us today that we should adhere to. So as we continue on in our lives this day, let's adhere to these words. Jesus, I trust in you. I continue to pray for you here in Poland. I hope you're all well. I miss you all and I look forward to seeing you again when I return. God bless. All right, and then he also had a couple pictures to show us of that he has taken. No, maybe later. <laughs> so yeah, so he didn't forget about us. He sent a message. So remember, we have to trust in God, um, especially in these hard moments that we're living now and our with our with our faith. So we just have to trust. So great message from uh, our chaplain. So okay, so then now uh, let me present. To you, our speaker today, and I just want to share just a little bit about him. He has he has over 35 years of experience in development, planning, and community engagement. A registered architect and a resident of over 30 years in Phoenix, he is the Southwest Regional Vice President and General Manager of Burns and McNall, and five a five billion private company, starting with a small Congenton and Patrick took the reins of a Phoenix office 12 years ago. It's now incomposed or composes of Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, and Utah, and within over 200 architects, engineers, and construction professionals, and near 1 billion in construction value. Patrick and his wife, Regina, who is founded the Republic Bank of Arizona in 2008. The Republic Bank Arizona is a 250 million community bank with four locations in the valley. Furthermore, they have two adult children who they call home fees. Their home, every member of the family is actively engaged in multiple community organizations and promote positive change for those in need and vulnerable in our communities. Those organizations include Arizona Science Center, Phoenix Public Libraries, and several smaller community organizations. He shares the, fi uh, the Finance Council for his parish of St. Joseph and the building committees for multiple parishes and the Dyson the projects. He serves as a judge for the University of Arizona's business school ethics comp competition and speak across the country in emerging leader groups. So Patrick uh, stated his leadership philo philosophy of inclusion, inclusion, collaboration, and communication, but also insists in accountability and velocity. He stands by his belief that the need is great, the time is now, and kindness costs nothing. Now, let us invite our executive speaker series. <laughs> wow, what an introduction, right? Great introduction right here. That's the first. How about that? Sound check? Here? No here? Good? Hi, Sarah. <laughs> hey, uh, oh. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Now that works, right? Okay. 
<laughs> well, thank you for letting me be your introduction. How many saw the video introduction? Okay, that was a wild, wild video. <laughs> Let's see it. So, uh, in the video introduction that I had going through, um, you know, I was on an exercise bike. And the intent was to show that many times through our life, we're going like crazy, but we're staying in place. You know, we're doing a lot, a lot, a lot. And we're not really getting very far. And um, what I've found and what I want to talk about tonight mostly is that many of us focus on the quantity of the work and not on the quality of the work, you know. Um, in corporate America, and I'm going to speak to that, I had a chance to meet a few of you before we started, and it's such a broad group of people out there, professionals, nonprofits, medical, banking, finance, development, I mean, it was the full gambit, teaching, education. So this is going to be tough to box this into an application that makes work for everybody, but I think the one thing, if we leave with nothing tonight, is that... In our world, many times, because quantity, you can measure. And so therefore, people tend to measure what they, you know, what affect change on what they can measure. And so it's not, my goal is for you, your name is oh, yes. William Pat. Thank you. William, at the end of this presentation, I want you to love me 30% more. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you measure that? Yeah. Right. I mean, how do we do that? It's not, it's very difficult, but because it is measurable, people tend to go after it. And we get caught up in that of measuring our life and we get caught up in measuring our activities. And how many times we really step back from that and say, is it really about the number of people we touch or how we affect, or is it about the, the quality of how we touch somebody? So there were three things I wanted to focus on tonight. One was the vital needs of what it typically takes to have a wonderful working job, a career. Two, how do we bring the, our, our faith effectively into our professions? And then third, you know, how do we keep our eye on the ball when it comes to really making a difference in people's lives? So we're talking about the vital needs of working environment, I, I've kind of come to philosophy that there's three buckets that people tend to want to look at to make a difference. I mean, there's lots of things that go into vital needs that you seek in your life. But if you thought about your job or where it goes into, what makes a satisfying place to go work? What is it? Well, first is you want to have a place you enjoy going to. It has to be a good place to work, a healthy place <coughs> to work, a place with good people place you feel supported, that it's okay to be you, that that you like the person you work for and you like the person that works for you and your coworkers. And it's healthy and a good conversation and you like to say stress-free, but does that exist? <laughs> and then, but you know, that it's a, a healthy, and some people can, uh, you know, quantify that as a, uh, or categorize that as culture, which is true. So you can have a good culture good place to work and love the, where you go, love where you go to work and love the people you work with. Two, you gotta love what you do in that environment. I mean, you can have the best brick factory in the world, but if, you know, if you're a chef <laughs> working in the best brick factory in the world, you're not gonna enjoy it. So you gotta find something you, you love to do and be able to do it the way you wanna be able to do it within reasons. The third is the lightest of the three, and that's the appreciation package. I used to call it the compensation package, right? You had to work at a great place, you had to feel like you did a great job, and you had to get paid the bucks to do it. Because the reality is when you come out of school, all you want to do is learn, 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 learn. I want to go to meetings, I want to meet with clients, I want to take what I've learned and I want to apply it, right? Money's not the big issue. Just send me to the North Pole. Just give me the opportunity to learn and practice. But eventually, life creeps in. You know, got student loans. I got a car payment. 
Yeah. Mortgage payment. Lord knows what that is today. <laughs> right? Probably got a family starting, maybe relationship. So I got bills to pay. So I got to mix it up. Right. So you got to put all three of those together. Now I've modified that and recently, and I said, you know, compensation is a portion of appreciation. It's certainly not all of it. In fact, I'm going to tell you a story. The first 20 years of my life, I worked for a firm that I absolutely adored. I was an aviation architect. That's my background. Uh, I worked in Hawaii. Who <laughs> got to like that? <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Uh, loved the company. Everything about it was wonderful. And I did that for 20 years. What, though, I found after 20 years is while the company hadn't changed, I kind of changed. And it was important to me that, you know, I wasn't really getting ahead in the world financially. And I felt like, you know, I could be doing this because I love what I do. I love the people. But ah, this part of me just is not meeting the needs that I have at this point. And so after 20 years, I made the change because somebody had recruited me and said, we're going to pay you this pile of money to do this. Right? And it was more money than I thought I'd ever make in my life. And I made the change. And um, while it was, um, I liked the people I worked with. And at the time, I thought, you pay me enough, I can do anything. I'll do it now. I'll stand on my head. Because <laughs> at that point, I realized that's not the case. Money doesn't solve the issue. Um, the environment was so caustic. It was so different than my faith and what I have learned to practice as a Christian that it really taxed me. In fact, to this day, that was 15 years ago, I had health issues that I know stem from that three-year period. It was important to get out of that. But, you know, I gave it the jolly try. I spent three years in there. Um, and... Uh, so I went to another firm and I called my lost two years because it, it was the two years I spent before I got to where I'm at. And in that environment, um, the people were great. The company, the money was good. No question about it. The job was so non-satisfying to me. It just, the last project I designed before I joined there was the Phoenix Convention Center. It was $800 million. It was downtown. It was exciting. I mean, I've done some wonderful projects, and now I'm doing Panda Express. <laughs> right. I mean, I like Panda Express. It's, it's, you know, I like the orange chicken. It's good. <laughs> right. But, and I still have coupons. If anybody needs orange chicken, <laughs> But it just wasn't satisfying. I mean, it just didn't get there. And eventually, I moved to the firm I'm at now, which I feel is an extraordinarily wonderful environment. I get up and I get to go to work. I don't have to go to work. I get to go to work. I work with people I truly love. The environment is awesome. I love my boss, my board directors. I love the people that work for me. I love the people I work with. It just really feels great. And I love what I do. I, I feel effective in what I do. I, I feel I'm good at what I do. Um, and then I feel incredibly appreciated in that part. You know, an appreciation, I want to go back to that just for a second. It's, again, it's not just about the money. It was in that example I gave you. But, you know, appreciation comes in the form of, you know, William, you're doing a great job. William, I'd like you to stand up and take a bow. William has been doing an extraordinary job for everybody. We owe him a great deal of gratitude for what he does. You know? Now, I, I'm going to do that instead of giving you a raise, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> But everybody wants to be appreciated. And I don't care who you are. I don't care if you, the, you know, our Holy Father, right? I mean, everybody likes a little bit of acknowledgement. Whether it's acknowledgement or it's praise or it's opportunity for advancement or opportunity to improve your career, just from recognition from time to time. Sometimes it's the littlest pieces that make the biggest difference. Again, it's not the amount. It's not the quantity. It's the quality of the event that counts. So we all could agree, or maybe mostly agree, that you know, wouldn't the ideal situation be a wonderful place to work, being able to do exactly what you want to be able to do, and to feel greatly appreciated and well rewarded for being able to achieve that. And so let's take that over here for today. That's what I would call 
the three vital needs it takes to put something together. And if you're in that, if you have an opportunity to influence any one of those three spheres in your career, in your life, you have an obligation to do that. You might be able to move the needle this much or this much, but not every great company that's out there started off great. In fact, most of them didn't start off great. They started off terribly. And some of the most terrible companies today were great companies at one time and lost their way. So when you find a great opportunity, a great environment to work in, and you love what you do, and you love the people you work with, and you feel appreciated, that's the pearl of great value in the work environment. And I ask you to guard that if you have that. If you don't have that, work on it. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Doesn't that be great moves? Just taps around the edges. Help yourself get there. The one thing I would say about this, though, if you are in a caustic environment, if you're not in a healthy environment, right, get out. Get out. You know, sometimes it's easier to change companies than it is to change companies. So that's the only asterisk I'm going to put on that. I'm sure lots of you look at that and you say, I meet my company, my environment meets all those. Maybe it meets all of them, but not enough. So you're going to work on that. The second thing I want to talk about tonight is how do you apply your faith in your everyday life. In a corporate environment, many times you are required to, or the inference is to be very agnostic, right? I mean, and I understand that. You don't want to be, you can't have the ashes on your forehead unless you're, you know, Father Alex. I don't know if Father Alex ever told you, but I cook once a month for the Crozier's. And on a side note, those guys eat incredible lot of money. They, I mean, they'll eat everything I make, and they eat a lot of it. And he's wonderful about it. But unless you're Father Alex and you get the opportunity to wear your uniform and be out in front of your religion every day, most of the time in corporate environment, you have less of an opportunity to do that. Sometimes you work in an environment, they give you a little space to do that. But let's suppose you don't. What do you do if you don't have the space to be in your faith? Right, what can you do? Well, the first thing I would say is be like Christ. Be like Christ. Are you forgiving? Are you encouraging? Do you find an outcast, somebody on the outside that's struggling, and you help them be better at what they do? Are you truly forgiving of somebody when they're remorseful, or do you hold a grudge? And then do you ask for forgiveness? when it's necessary. Are you gracious? And I, one of my, it costs nothing to be kind. It costs nothing to be kind. It's a freebie. It's the best gift out there to be kind. And then I would say, pray like crazy at work. I can't have a crucifix on my wall at work Right? But I have a small cross on my computer, and I, I mean, 30 times a day. God, I've got to write this email. It's going to be hard. Give me the words. Right? God, I'm going to have this telephone call in five minutes. I need help. I can't make this call by myself. It's just too hard. I get ready to walk into a conference room, and I know it's going to be a headbanger. It's going to be tough. <laughs> This is going to be a firm negotiation. Just a small pause before I go in. God, I need a minute here. I need you to be with me in this conversation. Help me to hold my tongue. Help me to use the right words. Help me to be generous. Help me to be understanding. Help me to see all sides of the equation. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Be with me because I can't do it myself. And expect God to be with you, because he's with you. You just need to, you can, it's okay to expect him to be with you, because he'll be with you. He's right there. The fact that you don't see him is you, not him. He's there. So expect God to be with you. Ask for his help, and bring that in. But I would say, to you know, I heard some great examples from somebody. I think it was Caitlin. No? Is that right? Caitlin, I got it right. Caitlin is an educator. Um, I thought it was one of the most perfect examples how you take faith in your day 
she took some young children and tell the example, Caitlin, you had them write letters to the Ukrainian students, right? Uh, they did art work and then we sent it to the Ukrainian embassy. And they distributed it. And they wrote back. Yeah. Right? So you took your faith as a Christian, you gave charity to somebody. You didn't have to say, I'm a Catholic and this is what we're doing. You did it by example. It was a small thing. And, and, and here's the point I would make as we come back. It's the smallest things like that that make the largest differences going forward. How many children on the other end of that equation saw that and were inspired by it? It wasn't the big bang. It was the small nudges that go forward. Which leads me to the third point. You know, keeping our eye on the ball when it talks about making a difference in people's lives. Some of you are in the medical field. Perhaps you're a first responder. You know, when people have a problem, you're right there to solve the problem. You've made a big difference in that person's life, and they'll know that for the rest of their life. Or you're an educator or a spiritual leader, and you've influenced somebody from the beginning to the end in their journey, and they remember you forever. But many of us don't have that opportunity. But I'm here to tell you that's the quantity talking to you. It's not the quality. Dr. Lewis was the Vice President of Student Affairs at the University of Nebraska, at the University of Nebraska. He got the same job at the University of Hawaii. And in the negotiations, he was allowed to take one person with him when he moved. And that person was my wife. Unfortunately, I got to go with her. <laughs> <laughs> this is when we're 24 years old. And we moved to Hawaii, and he was a wonderful mentor and made life great for us there. And then we went on in our careers, and we flourished. And so when I think back of the people that made big differences in my life, Dr. Lewis. And one time, about five years ago, just before he passed away, I made a commitment that if I ever made a million dollars, I was going to tell Dr. Lewis just how much he meant to me financially. And unfortunately, he passed away before I could do that. But at one other time, early in my career, when we were talking about how much he'd made a difference, he'd said to me, you know, I, I appreciate you saying that, that I was a big piece of your life, but you know how many people were part of that before I got to you? And it made me think about that, right? Who, who was the nudge that gave my wife the opportunity to work for him? Who was the person that gave me the nudge to meet my wife? Who was the person that did A, B, and C? So before we give gratitude, and we do, to the people that make the big event, there are a lot of people that led to the little events of quality before we got to the quantity. And many of us, all of us in fact, have that opportunity to give the quality of the small events that lead to the big events. And so I would just challenge you in your careers, especially I think as you navigate your careers, you're going to be asked to deal with the quantity. And you have to do that. Key performance, key performance metric indexes. You've got all these indices that say this is what you need to be able to do. And, and you have to do that. That's part of our jobs. But don't ever forget about that small piece of the quality of what it does. Right? We're not on the exercise bike. Right? It's, you know. It's the smaller quality. And if you're raising children at some point, you know that, right? My wife and I both worked our entire life. And our kids were daycare babies. <laughs> I know for a fact there were times when she was going south on the 51, I was going north on the 51, and we threw them out the window to catch the other one because they were both in hurries. <laughs> and I thought at my time, I'm the worst parent there is in the world. Today, they're my biggest inspiration. They are phenomenally well-balanced, wonderful children. 
I don't know how they did it. They were raised by wolves, and they just didn't want to. <laughs> and, and if you talk to him, I know my son would say here, he'd say, Dad, you were the greatest, you know. I know you weren't there for every event, but the ones who were there, you were there. So it was the quality, not the quantity, that made the difference. And don't get confused when you're in the rat race. That's the situation. And don't let anybody convince you otherwise. The other thing I would leave you with, and I don't know whether it connects the dots with this conversation or not, but your challenge is going to be navigating the gray area in your career. You have absolutes in your life that you will not vary from, right and wrong. But between right and wrong, there is a giant gray area that you have to navigate. And I'm not here to say that, that I'm not here to tell you what those, what those boundaries are, but I am saying that there is a lot of compromise in your day. And, um, you know, keep your eye on the greater good because it's not just what you do. It's the way in which you do it that matters a lot. You don't have to turn on the TV or listen to news too much or read too much paper to realize just that. Agree with today's politics, disagree with today's politics, I don't care. How you do something matters. How you do something matters. I leave you with that. And I leave you with this thought as well. Um, <clears throat> there are times in your career when um, people will say, you know, come on, come on. You're being too nice. Don't be a holy roller. Don't be, you know, don't give up this. You know, you got to be a doggy dog. If you want this, you got to dive in and make it happen. Right? Let me tell you. Get through these next 15 years, hold to your core values, hold to the belief that good is good, that kindness costs nothing, that integrity matters, that people matter, that God is with you, he stands right here beside you. Get through that. When you look in the rear view mirror 15 years from now, that's a job well done. Think about that. Look about that and pray about it. And I hope you're able to navigate that. Because I've seen people that deviated, that saw the quick buck or that saw the avenue to bend, right? And, and they have a tough time with the life, advanced life. They're having a tough time getting through life today. They're having addiction. They have challenges in their life. And I'm not saying that that's because of their bending. I'm just saying that the pressure to bend is is there and it's forever. But some of the most remarkable people I follow today in the real estate business, anybody in real estate? Yeah? Damn tough business, right? I mean, it is doggy dog. Chris Nord works for Chris Wakefield, one of my favorite people, not a Catholic. Went to work for me on a project when it was a very small project. He was a very new person. He did a phenomenal job. The company sent him down to help on my project because it was a small project. The vice president didn't want to deal with it. Chris dealt with it. We then did the next project. It was twice as big. Chris did it again. Next project was twice as big as that. Now all of a sudden the vice president of the company said, I want to be able to get in there. I said, no, give us Chris. He's been with us this long. Chris is now one of the top salesmen in the company. He's one of the most sought after people in the company, in the, in the, in the country. And his moral compass is absolutely straight north. He is a phenomenal person. He operates in an environment that's very difficult to have a straight and north facing compass. And he does it as good as anybody. But during that journey, he had arrows tossed at him from every direction. People told him you had to be a dirty dog to make it happen. And he refused. And he is a phenomenal good person. He is a great Christian. And he's earned the respect of so many people. And he set the path for so many people to follow him. He created the light, and now people are emulating him and what he does. Be that pioneer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you so much for those advice. Thank you so much for giving those advices of uh, kindness.
it doesn't cost nothing, right? Cost is it. And yes, as well as be able to like look and do the small events, right? To be able to continue on and make a difference because those little events are at the end, that's what makes those big differences. Not quantity, but quality. Quality. Thank you so much, Pat. You bet. Um, but if you could hold on for a second, because sure. we might have a couple questions here out in the audience uh, that would like to know a little bit more, maybe uh, different questions, either professionally or advice, I guess, at the very end. So I'm going to go all the way down there. I think it's in my contract. I can answer three questions. Three questions? <laughs> What's your name? What's your profession? And your question. I work in as a procurement analyst for a major trash company. Um, my question is, earlier you were speaking on the ideal work situation, yeah. and if it's not the ideal work situation, from what you were saying, I interpreted that as if you, you can walk away, if it's not the ideal work situation, then walk away from it. Um, I don't think that's quite what I said, but go ahead. To kind of elaborate on that or explain what to do if you are in a work situation that's not ideal and you can't leave it. Yeah. What do you do in those situations when you can't just walk away? So I don't think my words were ideal. My my words were am I okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, my, my words were caustic. If it's a caustic environment, this is an unhealthy environment. There's very few ideal environments. In fact, the place I work is not ideal. Uh, we always say it's not the it is the best place to work, but it's not the easiest place to work. Hmm. So um, it's rarely ideal. I don't know anywhere that's ideal. I don't think uh, Father Alex would tell you where he's at is ideal. But I think when it's caustic, when it's unhealthy, just like an unhealthy relationship, I think you have to evaluate very carefully how you want to continue in that situation. Uh, there are companies that are caustic, it's unhealthy. And everybody has a different tolerance for that, right? Somebody are draw, some people are drawn to drama, other people don't operate in all of that. But I, I would challenge this piece. Take the opportunity to try and fix that. Every time somebody has said something difficult about, for instance, um, Somebody says something difficult about my leadership style. It'd be very diff it'd be very easy for me to dismiss it. But I have to look internally to every comment, whether I feel justified or not. Is there something I can take away from that? It, I, I have to be responsible for the comment. Even though I don't agree with it, I have to be responsible for that. And the reason I tell you that is your work environment. So let's say that it's not ideal. It's difficult. Is that something is it as difficult as your, you feel it is? Is it as difficult, do your coworkers feel it's difficult too? That's not rhetorical. Oh, um, I am currently starting a new role a couple weeks ago. So okay. I'm in the learning, trying to absorb and learn everything. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry you connect the dots. I thought you mentioned maybe if you're in a difficult environment, do you move on? And I'm gonna simplify the answer, not necessarily. If it's a caustic environment, I want you to, to evaluate and determine whether you want to continue to be there. And, and companies with caustic environments don't last that long. So get out of it. But just because it's not ideal doesn't mean it couldn't be or that you still can't thrive in that. It's kind of just how you want to balance your life. Thank you. Now, question? True, true to the point. I'm not a psychiatrist, and this is absolutely free, so it's worth exactly what you pay for. <laughs> Question number two. Uh, I'm Nicole Hall. I work in Nicole. 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 Nicole.
that used to be a role model like up in the C-suite, and yeah. it turns out they're like they turned out to be anything but, but that. But that. Right? How do you come to terms? With that? Yeah. Good question. Good question. So uh, I'll put it this way. So the second company I was with. Um, I, I was at the C-suite level, knew people, I wasn't at the C-suite level, I knew people at the C-suite level, people I really admired in that level. The company was purchased by a larger company that came in, I'll get to your answer, it was purchased by a larger company that came in, a company that was 10 times as big. And what I, what was amazing to me is during that transition, things got tough. And what I saw, I mean, what's really amazing to me is you can tell a person steal by how they act under stress. And what I saw was people that I really admired up here, several of them, not all of them. When the larger company came in and asked to change the culture, asked to sacrifice some things that weren't, I didn't, I think all of us recognized weren't ethical. It was amazing how many of those people I admired ran for the hills, not ran for the hills, succumbed to the pressure and folded. And those that really had the steel said, I'm not going to do it. And I'll, there was a financial buyout in this company. If we stuck around, we were due, I mean, I don't know whether you think it's a big number or a small number. We were due for a quarter million dollar payout. And there were those of us that said, we're not going to do it. But you can't buy my soul for that. And there was others that folded. And what amazed me was the ones that folded. And it was disappointing to see somebody that you'd admired so much fold under that pressure. And, and the challenge with that is that when you see that happen, when you see somebody that's, that you admire full, you feel betrayed. And there is no greater emotion than betrayal. Mm -hmm. Betrayal encompasses all the emotions. You feel angry, you feel sad, you feel, you know, it, everything rolls up in that betrayal. And it, it almost makes you feel like all the other people you believed in What's going on? How can I believe in anybody? So betrayal is a tough emotion. So what I see people at the sweet when I see them fold under pressure like that, you know, at the time, I felt bitter about it 15 years ago. And I had to reach down and ask myself, Pat, you need to let this go. You need to forgive them. You need to forgive them. If you don't, it doesn't, you being angry at them, they don't care. <clears throat> they don't care. They're on their merry way. They've got collected their money. They're on I me. Mean, who's at hurting? It's like yelling into a cave. You know, <laughs> doesn't do you any good. So you have, that's why forgiveness is so important for people to let you down. You have to forgive them. And you have to let yourself give forgiveness and ask for forgiveness. Because, you know, that's the only way you heal from that. And you realize, too, that they're just the most obvious people that disappoint you, right? And then what's your biggest takeaway from that? I don't want to be that person. Okay? I tell my children, growing children now, you learn more from bad examples than you do good examples. You know? You, I mean, you see a lot of good examples. They make good examples in their life. But you see these bad examples say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So in a way, the people that disappoint you are part of the scar tissue that builds you for who you are. So that's a lot of words, but that's how I reconcile with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go next. Sure. First and foremost, I thank you for a fantastic talk, and thank you for just sharing your wisdom. There's no place for wisdom. It can't be bought. It can't be sold. It's just come from experience. So thank you. And for the record, I do love you 30% more, sir. You <laughs> <laughs> do a good job. Um, man, I kind of had. I love you, man! <laughs> <laughs> um, 
a little bit. 32 percent. There you go, right? 33, all right? So I'll, I'll just keep it pretty basic. Our situation in my company is we work for a great company. We're never going out of business. You know, basically recession proof industry. Uh, the head honcho, VP, senior VP is great. And then we've got one guy right below him. And he's kind of, he's a very complex guy. He's hard to deal with sometimes, but he gets results. He's a great earner. Yeah. So I can tell that the head shed thinks, like, okay, hey, yeah. he's, he's out there earning. Right. But I can tell, especially with a lot of the younger guys, the guys I mentor, it's like, oh, here comes so-and-so. Be on your guard. Right. You know, perk up. Right. How do you deal with a person like that? Right. And I, I've always kind of had the mentality of, like, you got to manage up, too. Right. You know, but what is your experience in terms of dealing with a guy that gets results and corporate loves him? And he's, he's, also, I mean, he's a smart, wise guy like yourself, right. too. Uh, but at the same time, it's also like, you know, does he really care about us or does he just care about delivering the number? Right. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's why I get back to, you know, it's not just what you do. It's the way in which you do it that matters. I, there's just so many pieces that I, I don't know the situation. You know, there are those people in life that are very data driven. Um, but instead of giving you maybe, I, I'm going to give you something that maybe you weren't thinking about. I think anybody that's navigating their career, it's so important to know who you're talking to and to know what drives that individual. The most difficult people I have to manage up to sometimes, what I need to do is step back and think, what is it that drives that individual? What is it? that that person needs in a conversation. We all know the individuals that want A, B, C, or D. Just give it to me in bullet points. Don't give me the detail, A, B, C, or D. And we also know those people that, you know, if you ask the time of day, they, they tell you how to build a clock, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you've got to know who you're talking to and who, how you want to get the results out of them. And I would give this, that I think that some of the most successful people don't ask people to chameleon onto them. They chameleon onto other people. My, I want A, B, C, or D, right? No, maybe, I know that when you come into my office, you're gonna give me A, B, C, or D. I know when Meredith comes in, this is not going to be a two-minute conversation. <laughs> There's no such thing as a two-minute conversation. It'll never happen, right? So you got to be prepared for those. And I think that's one of the things that I would say comes with experience is being able to understand the partner you have to deal with. I don't know this individual, he, she, I don't know. But I would say they're, they're probably driven by certain external pressure points and for you to be able to understand those and to be able to talk in his or her language mm -hmm. might get you a little bit further down the stage. Now, maybe they're just a bad soul. I mean, there are bad souls out there, but as you're, as the C-suite thinks that that person is really making it happen, right? I mean, then that C-suite's probably incentivizing that person to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I also don't, discount the ability to sit down. I don't know what your relationship with that individual is and says, you know, Jack, um, I'm just noticing this coming out of you. Is there something I'm not meeting your expectation on or is there something I could be doing better to make this happen? I don't believe in arguing with these person whose name's on the door. I think that's a bad idea. Always get along with your boss. Yeah. But, but I think how you communicate with them is your choice too. Yes. Another question? Yes, sir. Right there. So the name? Profession? Um, Patrick, we're so far away. That's okay. Microphone. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, Your name? I'm Christian. And, um, I mean, what? I'm Christian, and Christian. I work in tech. You're a Christian, just Christian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Catholic Christian, uh, I work in tech, but um, thanks for your time and uh -huh. all your wisdom tonight. I had a question about uh, 
in particular the failure part. So you've had a very successful career, but that doesn't come with a good challenge. And I'm wondering if you can share with us uh, a time that you have dealt with failure and what's been your, so to say, your, your method to not focus on the issue at hand, but the opportunity that lies ahead. Yeah. And so, do you have a personal learning, Joe, or something? Well, I would say this. I, I would give you this piece. I have had failure. I've been fired. I've been fired. And it, it felt terrible. I mean, um, I knew it was coming, so I understood that. But the individual came in, it was the third company, second company I worked for, it was the third company, it was bought by the bigger company. And the guy came in and said, hey, we've got a new organization chart and we've got all these boxes and we don't have one with your name on it. <laughs> How's that one? I, I mean, you, it felt difficult, right? And um, as much as I didn't like the company, it was still tough. But you know, failure, You need to wear it like a badge, like a patch on your arm. You know, I, I've been divorced, right? I've been fired. I've had cancer. You know, uh, uh, you know, uh, pick pick the pick the failure in your life, right? I, I cheated on my spouse. I, you know, pick it, right? Um, this is all star tissue that leads you to where you're going to be. There is no perfect soul. And in fact, I, I'll give you a better one. When I was, when I was in a panel the other day interviewing people for promotion, and there was clearly a top candidate that came in. And he, he this was the stuff. I mean, this may have happened, had his organization, good package behind him. Great results, climb the ladder, bing, 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 bing. And he said, he said, um, is there any reason you don't think that I would do well at this job? Thinking I was going to lavish on some more compliments. And I said, yeah, I think there's three. I think there's three reasons. The first one is I don't think you've had a tough enough career. I don't think you've had enough setbacks. I think if you look at any person that's wildly successful in your mind, you will find a massive setback somewhere in their career. Some piece of scar tissue that makes them who they are today. It is that scar tissue. It is that lesson learned. It is, you cannot teach somebody how to walk by reading a book. You've got to get up and walk and fall down. And I think that's the way you grow. So when something bad like that happens, terrible, thank you, God. Thank you for helping me understand humility. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to learn what this means. Thank you for helping guide me down the path that I know you want me to become, the person you need me to become. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I mean, every time you have a success, thank God. Every time you have a failure, thank God. Because those are the bites that build you to who you become. Meantime, you got to give yourself some forgiveness when you fail. Yeah, clearly. You know, we can sometimes we can forgive other people a lot easier than we forgive ourselves. I don't know. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I felt like it got kind of Hollywood on you. <laughs> One more question, maybe? Yeah. I know we're going over time, right? Yeah, I'm but sorry about that. Only three questions, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Double the page. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions there? Oh, I'm going to go to an expert here. So. Name, profession. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, Patrick. I'm Isaac. Isaac. Love the name. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I work in finance. And um, is that, I forgot what it is. What's your background? What's your degree in? Better use in philosophy, actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I like to hear the connection to those dots. I yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm an ex seminarian, so. Really? That's oh my gosh, you have a complex school. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, okay, back to your question. Yeah, so um, I'm a millennial, and. Come on! You know, right? I have a bad reputation, but I feel like, you know, when you're growing up, something that I've heard a lot 
is, you know, whether it's like from movies or mm-hmm. like parents, is there's like this kind of narrative about, you know, how you don't want to, you don't want to get in that job that works you a billion hours and you don't want to live your life just for money. And um, I think a lot of people, my like feeling or my perspective is that a lot of people don't pursue careers or like, you know, as I was growing up, it was like, I was always the one kind of pushing for like, well, you know, what about all these successful people? So like, what would you say to maybe a generation that maybe was scared into not um, pursuing a career or maybe doesn't kind of have that tenacity or like kind of ambition and maybe like ambition is a bad word these days. Like, what do you- It's not a bad word, but I I think Bravo. That's what I say in this. I think um, I'm so, a lot of people that, you know, you turn on TV, you read news. There's a doctor in doc. Uh, I deviate just for one second. Yeah, there's a doctor in Tucson, Doctor Wander Wild. He's a uh, and he advocates that in order for good mental health, you need to wean yourself away from news. So at least one day a week, uh, for week one, don't watch one day of news or read a paper. And week two, don't two days you don't want to do it. Wean yourself away from news. Not to be ignorant, but just there's so much negativity out there. I, if you look at the news today, there's plenty of reasons to be upset about the world. I am no, I am so optimistic about where the world's going. And Isaac, the reason I'm optimistic is people like that. People like what you said. It isn't about chasing dollars. It's about chasing the quality, not the quantity. I mentioned dollars a lot because money just buys you freedom. It doesn't really buy you happiness, of course. We all know wealthy people that aren't happy. But it buys you some freedom. It allows you to do some things that maybe you couldn't do otherwise. But I am so proud of the millennials today who pursue quality of life versus quantity of it. And when we hire people, the average age in the office that I have is 32 years of age. That's our average age in the office. Bright, energetic, ready to go. What do you think the number one negotiation tech negotiates? What, what's the number one thing they want to negotiate when they're negotiating? Time off. Time off. Okay. Time off. It's not even work from home. Surprisingly, it's not work from home. It's time off, right? And my counter to that is always time off. Vacation is just really compensation. I mean, if I paid you, if your salary was. There's 52 weeks in the year. If I paid you $52,000 and you said, hey, I want an extra week's of vacation. I said, well, why don't I just give you $53,000 a year and you take one extra week off without paying. Same thing. So time off. Vacation is just compensation. But I am so excited when people come in and say, I want, I want to do this. Now, the people that come in and say, you know, okay, I've been here six weeks. What's my path to CEO? <laughs> you, know, you know, I need some, you know, I've been at this position for, you know, what's my next step? What do I have to do? Well, it's not ABC. I can't, there's, it's not like the military, right? You time it over, move it up. It's not it. I mean, there's a lot to advance a career that has to do with timing, mentorship, good luck going through there. But I would say bravo to the people that pursue quality over quantity. I am so encouraged because I think that people of today that come out are more focused on the right things in life. That's not to say there isn't a lot to learn, but you've seen more than any other generation the effects of what it means to slave for your parents or your grandparents to be at jobs for 20 years. And when they graduate, are they really happy with what they did? Do they really feel like they're fulfilled in what they did? You know. Was the world a better place because of what they did? So bravo, that's what I say. I say bravo, stay with it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited. I, one of the things we do is in our firm is the renewable energy. And we do, uh, what we always say, we do what we do matters. I'm so excited for the future. What technology is gonna bring, I mean, there's bad stuff out there, but quit, there's always bad stuff. There's always bad stuff. But 
what the world's going to bring to us in the next 50 years is going to be remarkable. Lots of challenges, but we need faithful, good people who know kindness costs nothing and have a focus on what it means to make a difference in the smallest ways. Yeah, that'll change the world. That'll change the world. And I guess we have one more question. Oh, okay. Uh, We're definitely into OT here. Yeah, Joel. Joel! I'm also an ex <laughs> Okay. Um, work, I also work in finance. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, in corporate America, do you like, I know like Roe v. Wade, the Rose Wade. Over, right. overturned recently. Did anyone like at, like, how did you like respond to like challenging questions of like gay marriage and like, like when coworkers ask you, like, how do you respond and how do they respond when you tell them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First, I don't get asked about that too much, right? But I, I will tell you, uh, I recently was uh, selected to be on the board of United Way, okay? Now, United Way has been, uh, you know, there's some people who give United Way because they funded Planned Parenthood in the past, right? Uh, and I think in some cases they still do. So that's the gray area that I talk about navigating that you have to get in. And, and my position in my life was, you know, where can I be in an organization to help make it better? I'll never be in a situation that it will be ideal, but how can I get in any situation and make it better? And when people come in, uh, the biggest one was COVID. People didn't want to get vaccinated. We were going to absolutely mandate that people got vaccinated. Yeah, there's a tricky spot. I mean, there's no playbook for that as a, as a person that runs a company. So what do you do, right? And we just had to navigate it very carefully. I would say, <clears throat> in most cases, my solution was to pray a lot and to be open to, to suggestion and try to remember that everybody I dealt with, everybody that had a concern was a person that had a mother, a child, a brother, a sister. You know, they're the children of God. So when they become people and not units, or employees, you can usually come up with a more compassionate answer. Yeah, but there are sacrifices, there are conditions that you have to deal with. And there are places, probably the hardest part of my job is those positions where I have to be, you know, CEO, and I'm not a Catholic. Right. It's not that they come into conflict. They just have to have different hats. Yeah. I'm sorry if that doesn't answer. Yeah. Thank you, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, guys. I do have to agree with William about your quality information that we received today. So appreciate it. Thank you so much again. Uh, stellar presentation. And we look forward to maybe you guys will be able to talk to him. He might be staying here a little bit uh, at the end, more personal conversations with them. So uh, um, thank you so much, Pat. Thank you so much, Inga. So okay. So then now we'd like to bring up uh, director of a membership. He'll be talking a little bit about more information about what YCP has to offer and the perks that YCP uh, members have. Pat. Thank you, Rafa. First off, this is an amazing night. I'm looking around here, and you've blown our attendance expectations out of the water, and we didn't even have to bring along alcohol. Today <laughs> to do that. So it's really great to see everyone out there tonight. So uh, first off, what's, it really means a lot because for young adults, what we spend our time doing, attending events like tonight, really helps show what we want more of. And so going forward, we've got another event here next month um, that's coming up and we encourage you to attend that. So membership, you know, it's, it's part of how we would potentially ask you to support YCP so we can put these events on. And I think as we were talking about next month, we have a great executive panel discussion planned up. That's an event that does have a fee, but is free for our members. And that's just one small benefit that you get as part of membership. Uh, you get access to an executive mentor. I was looking at the system last night. There's something like 400 different mentors out there. So if you're at a spot in your career, let's say you're an engineer, you want to move into aerospace, there's probably someone out there for you. If you're a teacher that wants to say, I want to talk to someone that's done the move to get into management for be a principal, there's someone out there for you. 
That's one of, the many, one of many great resources that you get access to as part of a member. And as a member, you also have to fund these events, ensure that we can do more of these in the future. We've got a great schedule of things that are on the calendar and that will be on the calendar soon for our members. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at those. And so if you'd like to know more, I'm available afterwards to talk to and look forward to that. And Rafa, get back to you. Thank you, Andrew. So, okay, so then we will also like to bring up uh, Rachel and Dulce from the, from Gatic Charities in Mana House. I'm sure you guys uh, received information regarding a donation and a drive that we were having with the jeans. I don't know who brought jeans tonight. Maybe hey, later. <laughs> so they also will be accepting donations, so they'll be talking about more. So Rachel and Dulce. I am a young um, Catholic myself, as well as um, uh, a practicing Catholic too. I am. I work with Catholic charities. I, spe I specifically am the community engagement coordinator for um, for Catholic for Catholic charities program Mana House, which is a transitional living program for homeless veterans. So, um, Mana stands for Marine, Army, Navy, and Air Force. And we, um, and so Catholic Charities, we really provide um, everything for our veterans there. And so my, and so my job is to really um, come to community events just like this, but also to really show what our needs are for our veterans. And so thank you so much for wanting to donate and give um, great, and to give such great items that our veterans could always use that could always mean. And so hygiene items, clothing, I've even started a program which um, veterans who do move out of Mana House, I provide, well, Catholic charities and, and with donors, we provide a welcome home kit in which we have cleaning supplies. I even try to get microwaves, coffee makers, everything, so that when veterans move in, they don't have to waste that um, waste any of their money. They can save that for other things that are more important. And so thank you so much for inviting me. And if you have any other questions, I do have some flyers um, about Mana House. And if you have any other questions about Catholic Charities too, Dulce is your person for that. So here's Dulce. So, uh, well, my name is Dulce Valdez. I'm the Parish and Diocesan Engagement Manager for Catholic Charities. Um, it's an organization that has over 20 programs for people in need. Um, if you pull out your phone right now, you're going to see a list of all of the services that we have. So if you Google or you search uh, Catholic Charities, AZ.org, I would love for you guys to see the amount of services that we have. Because one of the things that we do is that we want to be able to refer people in need to the services that we have. And one of the things that I want you to see is if you hit that little um, line burger sign on the top left-hand corner, you'll see programs and services. If you click on that little arrow, you're going to see a list. We have affordable housing through Housing for Hope. We have low-cost counseling services for children, adolescent uh, couples, and other individuals. We have resources for domestic violence, a shelter, and for those individuals who are not ready to leave that abusive relationship. We have early education. We recruit families who want to be foster parents and want to adopt. We also have a private adoption. We have homeless services up in northern Arizona. There are many, many services that are that are needed up there, but there's not a lot of organizations up there. Uh, we have immigration legal services, low cost, a medical loan closet up in Prescott, um, Arizona. We resettle refugees here. We are always in need of items for them. We have a sex trafficking program. We help women and men who want to get out of prostitution to start a new life. We help women who are 
um, that have an unexpected pregnancy. We have veteran services like Nana House and veteran services up in Northern Arizona. And we also have a program for youth development. So you know that there is a lot of items, a lot of programs and services in need. Um, last year, we served over 15,000 people. The average is over 20,000 people, meaning that a lot of more people needed our services than ever before. And it's not about the, the quantity, it's about the quality. Um, we thank you, we thank YCP for having us for all of these donations. It is never too late to donate. Uh, with a donation of $10 tonight, we will be able to buy a pair of jeans for some of those veterans that are in need. Um, we work with the um, outreach center, right? The one, it's the veteran an outreach center that is located at the human sorry. Um, so on, on top of that we also have a big presence at the human services campus which is our big homeless shelter downtown and we have and it's called the VOC which is a veteran outreach center and that's where we get a lot of our referrals and direct service in which we in, 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 in which our workers give items that that the veterans need. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Lisa. Just uh, remember, it's never too late to donate. So it's Catholic uh, Charities AC .com, or right? Who say? Or perfect. So just make sure you go there and just take a, a moment and be able to donate if you can. Um, it's really great to be able to create this network. So we're we're local. We're Phoenix. So it's great to be able to connect with other Catholic or faith organizations to be able to help each other out. I think that's that's a blessing to be able to do and to react and be able to maybe, if not donations, maybe be able to contact those and maybe uh, donate not just money but your time. I'm sure they also need a volunteers there. So and uh, this other great Catholic organization that we that we have here locally. Okay, uh, we are also just make sure you don't forget to visit that table up there, the black table. Uh, they're offering uh, Catholic housing. So you'll be able to get more information regarding that uh, to be able to, if you're moving into town or if you know somebody's moving into town and they need somewhere to live for, for a bit, right there, just stop by at that table. Thank you so much for coming. And also uh, there's at the table, there's QR codes. If you take an, uh, an opportunity to be able to like uh, scan that and maybe do a little bit, uh, we have surveys to be able to, to just know what you guys need, right? What we, can we, uh, be better at and what are, we're doing a great job on this with YCP. So just take a moment to do those surveys. Yes, and of course, uh, great turnout today. So we got more food uh, that just arrived. So you're also welcome to get some uh, more food right there after you're, we're done with this uh, event. And as well, um, Julie wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the young uh, adult here group. <laughs> so yeah, she would like to share just a little bit about the group here. In this parish. Hi, I'm not going to keep you much longer because I also didn't get you quote for, so I want to know. Um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I run the Life Keeping Young Adult Ministries here at St. Bernadette, so I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Julie Recolato, and we have um, our next young adult event will be at the end of August on the 26th, and we have a group that we've been gathering for prayer and discussion. I'm just going to go a little bit deeper in our spiritual lives. Um, and in the fall, we'll have some more events, like two or three per month. So if you're in the area and you're free, mostly we do things on Friday nights. And um, if we do, we're going to do some hiking this coming semester. And if we do that, that's a Saturday morning. So that doesn't interfere with hopefully most people's work. Um, so they have um, all of our information on the website. Um, I have a, an Instagram at stbernadetteya, if you want to follow us. Um, we should be tagging a bunch of the YCP stuff from tonight, so just check that out. I just wanted to introduce yourself so you know who I am, and if you're anywhere around and you'd like to come to any of our young adult events or just meet up and have coffee or anything, I'm always open to that. So my email's on the website as well, and you're more than welcome to come to our events or to contact me. So thank you all for coming. I'm glad we could host, and I'll turn it back over. Thank you. I would like to invite our uh, director of finance and also VP for YCP Phoenix uh, to come and join us and do our prayer tonight.
Do we got the term? That's St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joseph, by the work of your hands and the sweat of your brow, you supported Jesus and Mary and had the Son of God as your fellow worker. Teach me to work as you did with patience and perseverance for God and for those whom God has given me to support. Teach me to see in my fellow workers the Christ who desires to be in them, that I may always be charitable and forbearing towards all. Grant me to look upon work with the eyes of faith so that I shall recognize it in my share in God's own creative activity and in Christ's work of our redemption. And so take pride in it. When it is pleasant and productive, remind me to give thanks to God for it. And when it is burdensome, teach me to offer it to God. Thank you, Joel. I'm the faith. So I would like to take uh, this time to be able to recognize um, our board directors, board directors. So I don't know who is uh, present tonight. Do you want to stand up? Hey. representing a high camp tonight, so thank you for coming. Spread the word, come back. We love you 30% and more, so keep going. <laughs> thank you, Claude. I just wanted to recognize you and other board directors and maybe for watching online. Uh, without you, this, this event would not be put up or together, so thank you so much again and for supporting us and for being present with us tonight. As well, I would like to recognize our uh, YCP Phoenix leadership. So I don't know if you guys want to stand up because uh, these events are also the legwork of all you guys. <laughs> so we have uh, right there Mar, which is uh, director of mass evangelization. Okay, then we have uh, I see. Let me see. I can't see. <laughs> that light is right here. Oh. Who's next to you, Mark? Yeah. Jessica. Jessica is the uh, director of outreach. And as well, Vanessa, she's the director of marketing. So if you see all those marketing ads and all those posts and great pictures, she does a great job with that. So thank you, Vanessa. As well, we here we have VP and director of finance. We have Joseph over there, which is Director of Operations. Thank you so for, for, for helping us with all this network. As well, we have Andrew right there, uh, Director of Membership, and myself right here, uh, Director of uh, Technology, with John right there in the camera. John, you want to see? You want to say hi to the camera? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so he's also directing the technology. So thank you so much um, for this great uh, evening that you guys able to join us. Uh, and remember, we have our next event that's coming up. It's going to be August 18th, so put it in your calendar. Make sure August, Thursday, 18th. Uh, it's going to be at St. Patrick's uh, Catholic Community in Scottsdale, so just keep that in mind. And we're going to have our executive panel discussion, as Andrew was explaining about it. Uh, another great event, so just uh, look, keep an eye out uh, for those uh, events that are coming up. As well, if you are interested in volunteering with us, also, just feel free to see if anyone that has one of those blue tags, just go and up to them if you're interested even uh, being part of the leadership or as well being uh, volunteering for this uh, great organization. So just remember just to ask questions regarding it, about it. And without, uh, I just want to again, thank you so much, Pat Edwards, for a great, great, great uh, speaker that you were tonight. And great information, I remember, so it's, uh, doesn't cost nothing, right, to be kind. And it's uh, quality over quantity. Thank you so much. <laughs> there's food, there's and network, thank you network too.
Oh, wait, hey guys, before everybody leaves, guys, so there's a, there's an app to